Thank you all for joining us. Um, the reason we're here today is to talk about uh, essentially um, it's a group discussion on how we plan the environments that surround us and the, how our prior priorities have changed. Um, what do we need to modify in order to Im improve our environment around us and how we should perhaps try to accomplish this in our individual ways. Um, and why we should revisit uh, the importance and the relevance of nature uh, in, in, in the environments around us and, in, and to do with our well-being. So let me hand over to Matthew Biggs, the famous and reassuring voice of gardening, <laughs> uh, and, uh, the well-known presenter and panelist for um, BBC Radio 4's Gardener's Question Time. Oh, that's very kind of you, David. Thank you very much indeed. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce you to each of the panellists. Uh, you have already heard from David. Now, David designs and creates the most wonderful, original, desirable contemporary sculptures, sundials and water features. But the important thing for him that is, is that he works with the client and responds sensitively to the needs uh, that they have and the location, particularly, where the art's to be placed. Uh, and during his career, he's un undertaken many royal commissions worldwide, and his work's been unveiled by the Queen Mother, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, uh, and the Prince of Wales. Uh, he's received two Queen's Awards for international trade, uh, and for, this is a really important piece of information because there's currently an exhibition of David's work in the Garden of Great Fosters in Egham in Surrey, uh, and that's running until the end of September. We're also delighted to have with us John Greenlee. Now John's an expert in grass ecology and a champion of the sustainable landscape. Uh, he's a garden designer and also an author of several books on, on the subject. He's based in California and he's created meadows not only in the United States but throughout the world. And his notable gardens include the Getty Museum in Los Angeles. Uh, he's also worked at the Norton Simon Museum in Pasadena uh, and marvelously created the savannas that appeared at Walt Disney's Animal Kingdom in Florida. And such is his passion for this subject that he's widely known as Grassman. Uh, and also we have with us uh, Charlie Luxton. Now Charlie's principal of Charlie Luxton Design, an architectural practice specializing in low energy, low impact buildings fit for the 21st century. And his designs aim to respond to the local traditions and materials so that they fit in beautifully and seamlessly with their location. Uh, Charlie's also a successful TV presenter, both here and in the USA, with programmes like Building the Dream. Uh, and he's currently filming uh, another new series, Historic Homes for Channel 4. In fact, he was telling us just before um, we came on air uh, that he's just finished the voiceover for the uh, end of his uh, eight years, I think it was, of series, 95 programmes. So that's a, that's a job well done and should bring a, some wonderful architecture into our lounges. Now, before we get going on the discussion, just a little bit of housekeeping, if I may. Uh, you can join the conversation by clicking on the chat facility at the bottom of your screen. But if you've got a question and you'd like to ask the panel, then please use the Q&A function, which is also there. And for discussions afterwards, we're going to be using the hashtag changing landscapes, all in lowercase and all one word. So that's hashtag changing landscapes. So now that's over with, let's uh, turn our attention to changing landscapes, the future of na nature and our homes, where we're going to look at the environment. Now, now we're all aware that since COVID-19, our lives have changed dramatically with lockdown, and bringing, which has brought free time to many. And suddenly our own habitat, our own homes and gardens have had a greater impact on our health and well-being than normal. I think this is the enforced opportunity to stand and stare has also created a greater awareness of nature uh, and of course the impact of our activities on the earth. So, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to begin our conversation with the house, Charlie, and then we're going to work our way out into the garden uh, and its statuary. So, so Charlie, I'd like to know what, what are your views on the current state of residential architecture and planning? As well, how well is it providing for the people? Particularly, of course, now we're living in a different world under the sh shadow of COVID-19. Well, thank you very much. Um, I think 
the huge issue is the impact that housing has on the planet. I mean, it's vast. In this country, it uses about 28 or produces about 28% of the CO2 emissions of the country go to warming and heating and lighting our homes. And if you add that construction, general construction is about 14% of the CO2, you start to understand that you know, building things and running the buildings that we live in has a massive impact on the environment, capitally, the planet, right? And I think that's something we're starting to understand and starting to challenge. And fundamentally, in England, we have one of the oldest uh, housing stocks in Europe, if not the world. A house built today at current rates of repair or re replacement needs to last as long as the Great Pyramids because we're just not building enough. You know, we've got a lot of housing, and we're not replacing it, and it really isn't fit for function. So we have a huge challenge both here and across the world and in the US. We need to totally retrofit all our houses to be carbon neutral by 2050. I mean, it is a staggering challenge. And I think if you sort of put that at one end of, of, of the kind of the, the, the string, the other end of the string is about the impact that they're having on our, on our health. And, and fundamentally, a lot of housing is not leading to good health outcomes. Um, they are damp, they are cold, they are hard to heat, they're poor air quality, and we're bringing a lot of chemicals into our homes and mixing them together to create not particularly healthy environments. So it's a huge challenge. But it's also a huge opportunity, right? Because if you live in a home that is low energy, it tends to be healthier. If you are living in a healthier home, you tend to be happier. If you create an environment around you that is sort of pleasing to the eye, it's not just sort of a throwaway thing. People that live in, in more beautiful areas, they, they work harder, they heal quicker. Like if you're in a nice looking hospital with access to nature through windows and views, you have a three day shorter hospital stay, right? So these things have real value. And I think we're starting to begin to understand the role that not just the performance of the home, but the aesthetics of the home has on us as, as humans, as, as creatures. And I think that gives me hope, you know, because if, if you can't find some, it's a pretty, you know, pretty bleak place. Charlie, how, how are you trying to improve this with your own designs? Well, we're, we push something uh, called a fabric first approach in our houses, which is um, where we insulate the structures so heavily that they need next to no heating. And crucially, we do a lot of thermal computer modeling to understand that those buildings aren't gonna to get too hot in summer because that's becoming an increasing problem. If you imagine the climate zones, not only for gardeners, I'm sure you all know this, <laughs> that as the climate zones move up, your plants aren't suitable. Well, as the climate zones move up because of global warming, our houses, our buildings aren't suitable. They're just too hot. So we're trying to factor that all in. And I think also we're trying to aesthetically sort of challenge our architecture to be more sympathetic with the landscapes in which we work. Um, certainly we work quite a lot in rural areas. So we're trying to really blend with the landscape and be sort of, sort of sympathetic with that landscape more in an English landscape tradition than say a French formal landscape tradition. And when you're working in more uh, urban areas, then it's really about like creating biodiversity, creating plant life in, in buildings, reducing the heat island effect, increasing air quality. And you know, our buildings can be enormously destructive or enormously creative. And I think every decision you make, you have to ask yourself that question. What am I doing? Am I genuinely creating for all? Or am I really creating for somebody and being quite destructive in that route? I think that's the kind of, the super lens that we're trying to put over all our work. Charlie, you actually mentioned there in your answer about the uh, the landscape and uh, the way that the uh, house sits in the landscape and the landscape has an influence. John, you've been a leader in the what could be termed the meadow revolution in the US. So you've been trying to maintain, uh, sorry, to replace the, the manicured lawns and flower beds with ornamental grasses. Uh, how is that changing life for people um, and for, of course, the local flora? Well, oh my gosh. Uh, I mean, after listening to what Charlie had to say, I, it just makes me want to walk outside. You know what I mean? It's like, I want to go outside. If, if what we're doing is we need to be outside, you know, not everybody gets to have a house in the country. And so I love, you know, the whole concept of houses and nature and whatever, but what if you live at the Barbican in London, right? I mean, a good example of, of fixing things is Nigel Dunnett's work at the Barbican. So if you're a student of architecture, you know, like if, if, if your architecture is, turned, is termed brutalism, 
you know? Like, what does that say about the environment, right? So, I mean, just to think of what Nigel did in downtown London on the Barbican, where he just took this horrible landscape and made it something special. I mean, it doesn't matter if you live in the country or if you live in the city, yeah, we, we can fix things. We really can fix things if we put our minds to it. John, just tell us a little bit more about your idea and the creation of meadows, because I believe oh. that the style of uh, an English meadow uh, with its uh, grasses and perennial plantings is a slightly different interpretation to yours in the US. Well, you know, what was fascinating about my career to me is, you know, it was the issues of, of gardening which you know, up until the 70s really was about decoration. It wasn't really about ecology and saving the planet and all that sort of thing. We were still just decorating. But the meadow revolution, as I would like to term it, is not necessarily just about grasses, but it's about gardening, actually uh, making the planet better, actually fixing the planet, you know, uh, bringing in birds, bees, butterflies, uh beauty fragrance you know and and having it be as charlie was talking about like we we can't have our work destroying the planet it, you know it needs to help add something to the planet to the spaceship indeed that we are on you know so so there you have it you know one garden at a time one garden at a time just <laughs> as, just as i'm sure you know charlie's approach is one house at a time you know, you, you got to wrap your arms around something and make it happen. Uh, what, one of the elements of, uh, of horticulture and out, outdoor art that I fairly sorely, sorely neglected um, is the placement of sculptures within, within the landscape. Uh, and, you know, we, we tend to think of them instantly in Italianate formal gardens, uh, but less so within landscapes. So, David, I, I've been looking at some of your wonderful uh, organic creations that sit, sit so beautifully in gardens, I have to say. So what's your philosophy behind your work? And, and, and really, what's the inspiration behind your designs? Yeah, inspiration. I mean, I, the, the, the long story is that I've been doing this for 27 years now, and it was, um, I was originally obsessed with time and my sculptures were all had a function of either time telling or using shadows. Um, I, I've always been uh, inspired by or obsessed with the, the movement of the sun or the, the rotation of the earth. So the pieces tend to be uh, site specific. They tend to be designed for where they're going. They tend to be uh, the, their environment that they're in is incredibly important. It's, you can't just take a piece and transplant it. It's, it's been specifically designed for a certain area. And as, as I've said on a few occasions, I'd like to think they're pieces that draw inspiration from nature. <clears throat> they are, they're referencing shadows, leaves, dappled light, um, and, and importantly, reflecting nature. Reflecting nature both physically, but also in their form, their shape. I just wanted to come back to two things, actually. That one thing that Charlie was saying about um, the uh, the process of, of creating a home. So we've recently been lucky enough to acquire six acres, a river, and a house. The daughters have all come home from a, a, a very old, a six hundred year old house. The daughters have all come home from university, travelling, and wherever, and that we're now all living not in lockdown, but in a in a very comfortable family unit. I say that, they're not listening. Um, and uh, the questions that are raised, this is very much uh, coming to your point, Charlie, about how we uh, engage with our environment, both in terms of the house and the further afield. And there was no question of us not doing geothermal, um, lime render, every, everything about the house, the insulation, it's wood fiber, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And it was simply because their decisions or their motivations for those decisions affect them and the next generation. We, you know, at, at the age I'm at, I'm sort of, I've ridden roughshod over the environment, but, but now this, this, this lockdown, this virus has forced us all to, to take stock uh, and just to, to 
to uh, reset the values, which is glorious. Um, I've gone off piece there a bit, but uh, essentially that's a, the, my, the nature that's surrounding me in this lovely dwelling is has totally reinvigorated my passion for creating and creating using nature as an inspiration. So, so you say it's inspired you. Just to give us some examples then, David, of, of where it's, what it's made you think. Um, walking around at five o'clock in the morning and watching water um, and the reflections of some trees above the water, that would light movements in the water, um, some, the swaying of some poplar trees. It's really basic stuff. I mean, I'm lucky enough to be looking at a Bronze Age hill fort one field away and the corn is, is swaying in front of me. I know this is an incredibly rarefied, you know, privileged position to be in, um, but I do think that anything that I can create, whether it's for a, a very small, modest garden in Chelsea or anywhere, this, um, the, anything we can put there that brings the sky down, the clouds down, or, or reflects a, a minimal amount of foliage, or just gives you another perception of something, or even if it just gives you that stop and think, uh, that that I find really a very strong driving force. Uh, Charlie David, David I love it. <laughs> Sorry, uh, Charlie David mentioned there um, about his uh, hill forts that he looks out onto, or the sites thereof. Um, how much do uh, ancient buildings and old mat building materials um, inspire you? Do they have a, a great influence on your thoughts for the future? Yeah, no, enormously, because I think, you know, I think architects traditionally have been in denial about time, about the fourth dimension. I mean, they like the idea that the sun moves across the sky, you know, David's stuff, and they often really tune into that. But what they don't tune into is the aging and weathering and decomposition of things and the world around us. And I think a lot of architecture is created in the kind of pristine environment of traditionally a drawing board or now in, in a computer and then sort of dropped into the real world. And there's an endless tension between the way these things actually weather and look over time compared to how they were in the pristine purity of an imagination. And I, I'd like to think that what we're trying to do is understand how the fourth dimension works. Now, in order to do that, a lot of the time you end up going back to quite traditional materials because they weather well and they last well and you're not shipping them around the country. So, you know, David's talking about sitting and looking at his Bronze Age iron for, I'm sitting here looking at Victorian viaduct piers and, and that is, and they're made with the local iron stone, which is a, a stone which has iron rust through it. And that absolutely drove the designer of the house I'm sitting in now. It was completely, you know, lifted from those and referencing those and respecting those. So I think, you know, connecting to the echoes that you see in the landscape around you and in the buildings is, is absolutely what we should be doing. I think this idea of glass, everyone, you know, I think there's a very sort of trite idea of modern architecture as white or glass boxes that landscapes. And actually I think modern architecture today or the cutting edge of it is much more humane and sympathetic and, and in tune with the traditions than, than, than that sort of element. You know, obviously there's the Zaha's doing strange sort of blobs around the world, but that, that feels increasingly irrelevant to me, uh, at least. So, so in a sense, you're thinking about uh, creating buildings that, that people have an em empathy with the structure rather than something that's sort of angular and white um, so that they so they actually can feel at home and comfortable. There's an instinctive feeling, I think, isn't there in a, you know, in a house using ancient material. We, f we feel almost like uh, enclosed and secure in that rather than the open open spaces. But there, there's, there's another thing going on there that, that traditional buildings are often breathable. They're often, you know, there's, there's, there's ways in which they breathe and hold moisture, which is totally different to modern petroleum-based buildings and insulations. So it is that, that's the, like, the literally of our environment, if you like, is literally how does a building physics function? How do you feel as a breathing bag of fluid, you know, a human, in this building and you feel totally different in a, in a low energy building than another building. And, and, um, and I think the, the important lessons here is that those apply to everything, everywhere. Whether you're in a city center in a, in a, in a small kind of uh, low cost flat or, or in a giant house, you know, those fundamentals of you and your physics are the same everywhere. And that's what we need to apply to all buildings and then layer on these other sensitivities. 
So, so what we're saying here, John, is that we're sort of we're looking out for for inspiration, for comfort, for, for focus, for the ability to switch off. But there's nothing as fundamental to our existence as as grasslands. I mean, historically, we uh, the hunter gatherers were on grassland. What what, what do you feel um, when you're planting out, um, designing these grasslands? Uh, does it uh, create a different emotion in you, and and do people respond differently? Oh gosh, where to, where to begin? I mean, um, listen, uh, I'm I'm fortunate that I sort of stumbled onto this expertise here in America about um, about grasses and having grasses become part of our of our language of of gardening. When I when I first started uh, with horticulture. Uh, there were only two ornamental grasses in the American nursery trade, and then it was about turf grass. So it was either whether cows could eat it or whether you could whack a ball on it. Nobody was really looking at grass as ornament. But I think one of the amazing things about what's happened in, in my lifetime is that gardening isn't just about decoration anymore. And it is amazing to realize that an abandoned elevated railroad line in New York City, the High Line, is now, which cuts right through the heart of New York City, like as urban as you can possibly get in concrete canyons, you know, with skyscrapers rising all around you, that, that the number one tourist destination is a garden, a garden in the sky right uh, on an old abandoned rail railroad line the idea that whether you're in a city or whether you're in the country that ecology begins as soon as you walk outside or charlie as, as soon as you open the window you know what i mean it's like there it is so um the amazing thing about you know i mean i love we joke all the time that you know i cut trees down where i come from because i want more light for grass you know than just trees for shade but you know the, the the whole point of it is is what grasses do in in the landscape is uh is most grasses and you know um david absolutely understands this is is most grass foliage is translucent light passes through it so when you have grasses in the landscape whether it's early morning light or late afternoon light it's just this amazing interplay with light. And it's also the fact that grasses are so fine that they move, right? So using grasses in the landscape is also like painting with motion. So there's lots of things that grasses do that a lot of other kinds of plants don't do, but grasses are just part of the whole thing. And so what I think the whole prairie movement, ornamental grasses, however you want to term it, ha has made people rethink, you know, that when we're gardening, we need to not just be decorating. We need to be, you know, adding value. Uh, and, and how does the, uh, you know, how did people first react when you said to them, look, let's plant oh my up? God, they, they, they're like weeds, you know? I mean, my first garden shows, we, we, uh, they would be Snickers, you know, just, and it was so funny too, because my first trip to England, when I got to meet Penelope Hobhouse and Rosemary Veery, and we were looking at all, it was at the height of the perennial gardening movement in America anyway. So everybody was looking to the mother country, like let's look at all these fabulous perennial borders. And there would maybe just be one or two grasses just sort of, you know, here or there. And I remember, I, rem I remember Penelope Hobhouse telling me like, oh, John, all those grasses that you have in America, they just don't work here in England. And then I went to Kew and here was this grass border at Kew with all the things that Penelope Hobhouse told me would not work in England. And there they were, you know what I mean? And yes, so I, I remember those from my student days. In fact, I think they're still there. There is still a grass, uh, grass collection near the there job. There is, and it's a fine collection, I might add, you know? So, <laughs> so anyway, I, I, I it's I just, it. you, you realize that, that plants, and like architecture, and I'm sure Charlie will agree with me that, 
you know, there's, there's fashion, there's periods of fashion when this is fashionable or that is fashionable and fashion is fashion. That's okay. But ecology is not fashion. So I don't care what your fashion is as long as it's good ecology. How about that? Yeah, yeah that, that, that's a, that, that will do. <laughs> but, David, when it comes to, uh, to placing your um, art, what, what are the, what are the considerations? Well, essentially, I need a beautiful contemporary but eco house with a lovely <laughs> meadow in front of it. And, <laughs> and how well, often? Oh, <laughs> uh, um, I, I, God, the, the, the piece will, it, ideally the piece will have been designed for the location. So we will have, we will have spent quite a lot of time looking at the location, what's going to happen. With the shade, the trees, the light, you know, what's going to be happening in five, ten years' time? Is the oak going to be there bigger or whatever? Um, I, I think I've mentioned it before, but I always see these pieces as, as they, they're not about the piece so much. It's about what the piece reflects, how the piece embellishes its environment. So it may be that you want to look out of the house. I'm hoping that it, it either mentally draws somebody down the garden or physically it draws someone down because it, it is so, it's beguiling, it's, it's curious, they want to engage with it. Um, but it certainly should be something that, has a, that, will, that will function just intellectually from the house or closer up. I see it as, as um, a totem in the landscape. So it's drawing somebody out into the landscape because I have to say I'm a great believer in getting out of the house and, and immersing yourself in in the environment around you. Um, so the piece should uh, act as a, as a magnet for the, both intellectually, aesthetically, but also you know, as a physical destination. So that's what I'm hoping for. I'm hoping that people see it as it, it's worth making the effort down the garden, across the field, up the hill to this piece to get a, a, better, a, different, a different sense of it from the one that they saw you know, from the from the building or the avenue or the vista that it was originally created for. Charlie, David there just talked about going out uh, into the green spaces and uh, you know just getting out of getting out of the house. I I believe you've had some experience with uh, or working on a project at the moment uh, which involves uh, green space. Yeah, well, we, we've been working on a, a community-led housing project, actually, in, in the village where I, where I live. And that's been a really interesting process because you assume, you know, creating environments, certainly in Britain, you know, the developers who build most of the housing, eight developers build 60% of the housing. So they have eight sort of ideas and they sort of roll them out. And it's often a little box with a little bit of garden all around and the box takes the middle and all the gardens fragmented. And you think, well, they must know what they're doing because they seem to build a lot of them and people seem to buy them. Actually, when you start looking into it, something like 74% of people would never buy uh, a new house. So that's a, a pretty kind of damning uh, statement. But when you then start working with communities and say, well, what's important to you? If you, we're creating a community building and we're looking at work, we've worked in the village to create actually 12 units, but we've worked with about 40 or 50 people in the village. And we've said, well, how would you like it? Like, would you like little gardens or would you like shared space like the green space that you own and look after together and smaller gardens and would you like the cars right next to your houses or are you prepared to walk from your car to your house to get to car landscapes not domin dominated by cars and you're always slightly nervous going into those interactions because you think well the developers must know what people want and they want the car outside the box blah 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 actually they don't when you ask them i mean they're self-selecting you could argue but the very wide range of people we've been talking to when you ask them, they're like, no, 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 I much value the green space, the shared environment, as long as it's well looked after and well designed. And, you know, this is a tight, fairly almost urban site. That's what they want. And that, you know, that gives me hope that, that there is a massive disconnect between the kind of landscapes that we are creating, sort of the development, you know, developer, profit driven developers are creating and what we actually want. And I think the conversations that we're having about grassland, about biodiversity, about drawing people outside to high quality environments is like it's a, there's a real opportunity there that we can explore and 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 i think there is talking about this idea you know of blurring that boundary between the house and the landscape and trying to drape that landscape onto the house onto the roof you know into courtyards 
right up to the building. And the amount of benefit you can do for biodiversity, for rain runoff, for flooding, you know, it's incredible. And I think if you create high quality environments that have a real seasonality about them, like, like grass, I mean, I've spent the summer staring at my grasses. I've stopped mowing my lawn and I've started mowing little paths. And it has been a mind blowing experience, the amount of wildlife, but just the change, again, that fourth dimension of time, that people do respond to that if you do it well and put them in contact, you know, in contact with it. I think people change their sensibility, which COVID has really shown that. We are ripe to change and evolve. And I think we as designers have a real opportunity to exploit that. So, so uh, obviously you've been spending quite a bit of time with John then, if you're now loving, loving your grasslands. Uh, Literally uh, lots of time with John, yes. A lot of time communing with grass this summer. John, uh, tell us about some of your projects, because we mentioned them earlier on. How many different kinds of grasslands are you creating? Because obviously it's not just you know, one size fits all. No, I mean, the, the interesting, I think, story about grass is you know, I mean, and, and the, the famous German botanist who championed ornamental grasses uh, really in, in modern times, uh, Carl Furster, you know, referred to grass as the hair of the earth. The, the point of grass is whether you're right on the water's edge by the sea or all the way to the top of a mountain, in almost every ecology, you're going to find grass at some point in the forest, in meadow openings. I, I do think there is a human um, draw to quote the meadow because really where, you know, the place you want to be is by the river, but you don't want to be in the deep dark forest, but you want an opening, but it's nice to have some forest around you. So the meadow is just sort of where that's, that's the place you really want to be. That's the place where humans said, hey, this is, there's a tree I can climb to get away from, from the carnivores, but there's open grassland and that's where the game is and that's where the berries are. And, you know, so I think we're, we're predisposed to, to want this ecology that, um, you know, that, that's full of life, I guess you would say. So, but in terms of how grasses and gardening, I mean, we're still, this is why I think what I'm doing right now you said, talk about my projects. I just feel like my best work is in front of me, not behind me, because there's never been as many grasses uh, in the nursery trade, because it's one thing to see things in nature, but you know, it's another thing to be able to get those materials and then include them in your gardens. You know, I'm doing work now in Europe. I'm, I'm really excited about the work that I'm doing in Europe, to be honest with you. I've I'm now working with Stauden Peters, with Klaus Peters, one of the largest perennial growers in Europe, and they supply England, by the way. And so I just made this garden at this famous uh, place in Holland called Appleturn, this idea garden. And what gives me great pleasure is I planted this garden with native European sedges that I had to bring from America because they weren't in the European nursery trade, okay? Like I couldn't plant the native grasses <coughs> of Germany and Holland because they weren't there. So, you know, I just think the most exciting thing is the work that's coming forward. A lot of my early work, I worked for other landscape designers. I was just the plant nerd. I didn't have access to being the landscape architect. And sadly, what happened in the field of landscape architecture is, it got away from plantsmanship. And, and that's why, you know, I, that's why I came to England because for me, you know, the mothership is, is, you know, James Hitchmaw and Nigel Dunnett and Cleve West and Dan Pearson and all these people that, my heroes that are bringing, that are bringing plantsmanship back to landscape architecture. And then yes, like, like Christopher, I mean, we, a garden could also be cleaning the runoff water that comes off the parking lot, you know? So, you know, is it a bioswale or is it a garden? Well, it's both, you know? And so I just think the, the most important work is, is really yet to come, you know? And we can still have fashion, you know what I mean? We can still change our shoes. 
That's very kind of you. Thank you very much indeed, John. Appreciate that one. Uh, in interestingly, um, I've just been reading a book called The Forgiveness of Nature uh, by Graham Harvey, which is the story of grass. Um, and that uh, has some very uh, sort of interesting reflections on grasses, the way we approach them, you know, what they've done for us uh, in the past. D David, what, what sort of percentage of your statuary uh, goes into grasslands? Because in, in, in a way, you could think of your pieces almost like a, you know, like a totem, like a focal point where people can go and uh, meditate, if you like. Uh, and they are very spiritual, I thought. Yeah, well, that's very kind of you. I mean, I, I'm, I hope they have a, uh, an energy you know, and hopefully something uplifting and, uh, and uh, nurturing in, 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 both in terms of an aesthetic. Um, uh, in terms of grasslands, I, I, if I'm asked where something should go, I will, and we, will, we might be looking at a formal lawn, a parterre, which is crying out because it's got an empty plinth in the middle of it. But I will look beyond the hedge to the wildflower meadow that they're not quite sure what to do with. And I'll say, let's put it out there. Let's, let's extend the, the range of the house into the slightly less kempt part of the garden. But by putting something sophisticated there, you are, you're effectively emotionally extending the garden. So <clears throat> I, wouldn't, I, I can't give you a figure of how many of ours are in wildflower as opposed to formal settings, but I do know that I will always encourage the placing of a piece in a more natural um, environment, whether it's in a, a, in a woodland or on the edge of a wood or right at the very edge of the field um, or the field of, of the garden. It's, again, it's, it's causing you to draw your eye down and beyond into, into the bigger picture of nature. Um, the, David, I noticed this as well that quite often you, you know, you have water, fe water features or you will modify uh, some of your sculptures to incorporate water. Yeah. Why do you think water is so important? Oh, it's just, um, it's life-giving, it's energy, it's uh, our, we have a primeval instinct, you know. Uh, the the uh, Arab, Arabs were brilliant at uh, manipulating water. Uh, I, I have a modest property in Sicily where there is a rill that's been running constantly, carved into the hill by the Arabs 1,200 years ago. <clears throat> and this is a life-giving energy source. So when I put a water feature, whether it's in a, a, a small courtyard garden in London or whether it's a, on, the, on, a, on a grand lake in a, in a stately home, this water feature has a, it just reminds us there is, a, there is an energy and there's a life-giving um, dynamic to it. I am also obsessed by the reflective qualities that you can create with water. Um, and you mentioned earlier sort of the, a zen-like quality, just sitting and watching the movement of water is, is extraordinary. It's, it's meditation in, in, a, in its most pure form. I mean, a lot of what we're talking about is actually sort of solace for the mind and you know making uh, better environments for for us to live in so that we can feel more at peace and yet a few months ago sort of pre-covid we were about you know packing as much into life as we possibly could making the most of the time that we have on this planet and, and you know it was a really you know, life was a very frantic experience for a lot of people so, so charlie now that we've sort of calmed down a little bit and had this uh, opportunity um how do you think that uh, our buildings could be improved so that we can gain more spirituality from them, if you like, uh, and they are you know, better for, for our spirit? It's just a better place to live in. I mean, we're asking people like you to, you know, to build us houses. What, what are you going to do? How are you going to achieve this? I think the, the, the irritating thing is we've known for a while sort of what we need to be doing, but the world has been too noisy to listen you know and, and i'm not saying that, I've, that we've got all the answers but there's been a direction of travel that hasn't been listened to that we have shortcut shortcut for commercial gain again and again and again and i think the reason we do that is fundamentally bad accountancy that we go profit and loss well there's a profit long-term loss i'm not interested in and i think maybe what covid has helped people understand that a bit of investment now like can you know don't lose the ship for a hapeth of tar. And we've not really been doing that. We've just been 
extracting as much as we can out of the moment. And actually, if you build a sustainable building, it does cost more money. Everyone will say it doesn't, it does, like five, 10%, but the long-term value just in the running costs are incredible that if you add it up. The long-term health income outputs are incredible. The long-term life outputs are much better. So we've known there's long-term value. What, what I find extraordinary is that we have made a societal decision both in, in England and in America and around the world for the state to spend vast sums of money dealing with COVID. I mean, astronomical sums of money for a disease of an unknown impact on society. Now, I'm not, I'm not trying to denigrate that or undermine that. It's significant, no question. Climate change is like definitely happening and definitely happened to a very large event with much bigger impacts potentially what I think we all now understand on society. So why aren't we investing the flipping money on climate change that we've already invested on COVID? You know, and I think that is where we need to start asking some questions. And I hope that this tear in the sort of fabric of our society is going to let some new logic in because it hasn't. And we've got to change the way we're doing it. So I do feel that there is a great opportunity. Architecture can't solve it on its own, right? There's just no question. We can't do that. We need society to understand and change its value set. And I really hope that people take this opportunity to do that. I sound like a really ranty person right now, but I feel very strongly about this issue. And I've been banging my head on this one for 25 years, like going, we've got, we've got 25 years, we've got 30 years to deal with this. We've got 15 years to deal with this. We've got 10 years. To, we've now got about eight years, nine years to deal with this thing. And we haven't gone anywhere yet. So oh we've God, got yeah. to do something fast. And I think there is, there is, that's the opportunity. We've got to take this opportunity to make change happen. Now, now uh, John, you've heard uh, Charlie's sort of impassioned uh, plea. Uh, what's your impassioned plea on behalf of grasses and our change towards the environment and landscape? Oh my God. You, one of the things that I think a lot of people aren't, because listen, the elephant in the room, there's a couple elephants in the room, obviously COVID, you know, the, the point of it is, is we're on a spaceship, okay? There's nothing on the moon. There's nothing on Mars. It's like right here, right? So the whole thing about COVID that nobody seems to talk about is people stopped playing games, stupid games, throwing balls, catching balls, bouncing balls. And instead you had to stand there and look at your world for maybe the first time you had to look at your world and all these meaningless games, as Charlie is saying that the clock is ticking and like, come on, let's stop playing games and start, you know, taking care of the planet. We just, we just have to. I mean, we just have to. And so uh, the other elephant in the room is, and, and I, I, I was, I would just want to let you guys know that there's a, a group of us here in America that we're, we're sorry about the American Revolution and we want to know if we can join the mother country again. <laughs> because we, a tyrant has taken over the colonies and we, we're sorry. We want to come back. <laughs> well, you've got two uh, quite sort of upset here, uh, upset people here, David. So we need to bring some uh, uh, Zen back into this. I, think. I have a, I have a positive spin, hopefully. Okay. Uh, um, it's that, and it's some. It references exactly what the the other guys have been saying. The tear in this fabric, and I and I made a note when you said that, Charlie. Is that, is that? I mean, it's been an absolute epiphany for me. This clean skies, clean air, people being, being nicer to each other, people giving each other emotional, physical space. And we're all, uh, we've, the, the, the noise, the chatter, the clutter that had filled our lives. I'm embarrassed to say how many flights I took last year, you know, on business, because it was essential that I did that. I've taken two this year, and I haven't, take, I haven't taken any since February. And I'm, I'm looking forward to not taking any for the, for the, the foreseeable future. <clears throat> there's, there's an emotional change. There's an intellectual change. Um, and really, it's about, you know, we, we've been given this one opportunity to put the handbrake on, see what's, what's around us, and acknowledge that the fact that it was broken before. It, it, it functioned. We, that, that, that was our world. <clears throat> But I really believe that this is an opportunity for us all to take a deep breath, take stock, and actually 
be re-energized by by nature by <clears throat> the simple things in life having um, air in your house having uh, a sense of an, an aesthetic that doesn't cost anything but allows you to take pleasure in things whether it's a wish a, a, the movement of wind through through grass which has 17 functions apart from just pleasing your eye uh, or whether the house that you're in uh, i mean my I, my daughter's held us to ransom we were not going to get away with doing anything other than the full-blown geothermal despite the fact the original cost of doing it is is astronomical compared to sticking in a diesel diesel fired boiler and this is <clears throat> it's a game changer we we have made a commitment to something that is going to be sustainable and uh and benefit the planet and anyone who who comes in contact with it for the next two three hundred years the house is six hundred years old it's done its job um but it the, the next this next phase is either tipping the balance one way or the other so i think this is a it's a great opportunity everybody i meet is a, is aware of it subliminally or overtly but everybody senses this this is a change i mean we're listening to the environmentalists and we're listening to people who have been concerned about it for years or have an inkling of it but now it there's a sort of there's a real understanding of that this is an opportunity to change i fear i really fear that we're not going to going to use this opportunity but i sincerely hope we do and it's about aesthetic it's about the environment it's about everything i think also i'd like to make a quick point that, that we're four white men having this conversation and I, I think genuinely like the black lives matter thing would not potentially have happened without the covid breath or breath, you know breath pause and i think we are starting to go well, wait a second there are all these structural issues that we're aware of and where we it suited us not to be aware of i think that's a really important thing to note and i think it, and leading on from that is that we are not going to be fairer and kinder to the environment until we are fairer and kinder to each other I just don't think those two things can operate in isolation. We need to be much nicer to each other and from that will flow a genuine appreciation and fairness to the planet. And I think, so we have to grasp this opportunity as well, which is happening, I think. I think there is genuine change there. I do agree with David, we have, that there is a likelihood we'll lose this opportunity fully capitalized, but I think we can already see the changes occurring. That's lovely, Charlie. Thank you very much indeed. Well, we'll, we'll leave it there and uh, we'll go to the questions. Delighted to have some uh, questions. So um, this uh, first uh, question is, I'm looking for a name, it's Craig Marston. This is from Craig Marston. Uh, Craig says, Charlie's thoughts related to self builders or possibly small developers. What about the design and construction quality of the volume house builders or the local developer from sort of five to a hundred units where they put money first and don't even employ architects or designers? These outweigh the rest that the good of us do. So, so what are your thoughts? Well, I think, I think that statistic that 74% of us wouldn't buy a new home is a pretty damning summary of what I believe that they're, they're doing. And I think the issue we have is there is, again, a lack of fairness in the, in the planning system. It's a, a winner-take-all system. And we've created one where the large developers have got big war chests to take pieces of land, thrust them through the building system, the planning system. Once they're through the planning system, they don't really care about the thing that they build because the, num the, 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 the fracturing of house type, the households that we've got means we need so many new houses, they could literally build anything and it will sell. Okay, that's my opinion. And then the government has artificially in the last couple of years pumped 680 million into supporting those poor quality houses. So we fundamentally need to totally change the way in which we plan new housing. We need to look, I think, more to the European model where we zone bits of land and say, we're going to build new housing on that land. You, Mr. Mr. Landowner, are not going to get five million quid and disappear off to the, the Bahamas and everyone else has traffic, you know, more traffic, construction noise, longer waits at school. We're going to try and do it in a more fair and inclusive manner. And I don't, so that's what we've been trying to do with our local community project. But I think it, it, that approach scales, right? We need people involved in the housing near them. All the housing that we celebrate in this country and around the world generally comes from involvement of the people who are going to live there because they will pour in love and care and they will think about things in a longer term scale than just build it and get out of town with all the cash and i think that's the big thing we need to change um 
come, this next question is actually, I think, for John, um, uh, and the, it's from Nicola Levy. Uh, Nicola says, I'm English, but live in America. I've gardened in both places and see differences in people's attitude to gardening and their interaction with their gardens. Do you see differences between both countries in the trends towards horticulture, environmental change and sustainability? Well, my gosh, absolutely. You know, uh, the, the American, I mean, as I grew up, I mean, the, 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 the American lawn, Lawn is what most Americans still do when they garden. They make lawn, they build lawn, they maintain lawn. And as we now pretty much are aware, if you're, you know, have any clues, sensibility at all, you realize that like lawn isn't really good for the environment. So, but interestingly, the, the model of the lawn comes from the big English estate, you know, the big English lawn. And so, Everybody wanted their little patch of lawn, but it, it just doesn't make sense. And I, I have, you know, my, my background actually, as I mentioned earlier, goes back to the early influence of, of um, you know, Rosemary Veery and Penelope Hobhouse and decorating and doing all this sort of thing. But to me, like just even, just look at Great Dixter and look at Christopher Lloyd, one of the icons of, of gardening across, on, on both sides of the of the Atlantic and the last thing he did with his, his last book was about meadows was instead of the famous perennial border that Dixter was famous for it was oh my gosh nobody ever plowed this land it's actually a reservoir of native British ecology that's almost unparalleled you know so it's it's like we're still getting lessons back from each other and I, I find it interesting, you know, Prince Charles has, a, has an American prairie in, in his garden. You know, he has native North American plants in, in his garden. So I, I think, you know, we're still learning from each other, but uh, Americans, you know, there's more horticulture in the little tiny tip of a finger of most British cottages than, than in most American gardens. Like we still are ecologically, and horticulturally illiterate over here in America. And if America did become a gardening nation, if we actually did become a gardening nation, watch out, you know, <laughs> I mean, watch out. That's all I would say. But, you know, I mean, if we all went outside and gardened instead of watching the Super Bowl, it, it might be a whole different world. Um, in fact, I'm sure it is, <laughs> it would be. Um, there's a question, a question here from uh, Richard uh, Williams for um, David, uh, and the question is, how, has the current situation changed your thoughts and your opinions on the importance of sculpture in the landscape? Um, it's actually changed slightly, it's changed to how we mm, create things. I'm not, so, I'm not so sure about the sculpture, but I, I, I'm hoping that my pieces, we're putting more and more pieces in the public domain, in parks, woodlands, and, and in sort of urban developments um, for their sins. But we are, we've, there was a, mo driven in part by my daughters, uh, we have reassessed everything that we acquire, whether it's metal, stone, and the processes that we're using. We, we have always said we're not going to use anything that is um, uh, that won't last 500 years. So the metals and the glass, glass, stone, etc. It has to last. But we are we're wanting people to we want more people to benefit from the pieces. It's glorious to put a an enormous Taurus sculpture in a private garden in in the in the home counties. But it's much more uh, rewarding to put it in a public place so that it can be engaged with and enjoyed by people who wouldn't normally have that. And there's some interesting examples of that. I mean, um, Michael Freeman of Argent Developers created at King's Cross, I think an iconic attempt at uh, engaging the public around what was a very successful urban development as well. So there, there are people out there who are inspired and will, will see the benefit of sculpture and a natural swimming pool you know, 300 yards from King, King's Cross Station, open to the public. It's, that's a fairly um, imaginative piece of, uh, 
urban development, I think. Um, that, I think that that's really a, a great to think that uh, the sculpture is being brought to the people because that it, it is such a uh, it is something for every everything uh, for everyone to enjoy. But talking on a different level, we've got uh, somebody here who's an uh, anonymous attendee who uh, wants us to consider artificial lawns. It said this morning's BBC Radio for Today program raised the question in response to a pre professor Dave Goulton's petition to ban them. Is it so awful for urban dwellers to have plastic grass? Anyone? I've got to, I've got to say something here. Um, I heard that programme and I was going to reference it. And of course, of course, it's maintenance free and it's uh, presumably, uh, it looks good. It is from my, I mean, I, I'm again, one of the four, you know, white males living in leafy Oxfordshire. We're privileged, I've got grass coming where I don't want it to come. But <laughs> this is, <laughs> yes, um, I'm never happier than when I'm on my tractor. But um, <laughs> this is, it's, it's just uh, an appalling concept. Um, I took my daughter to a hockey match that was being played on acres and acres of plastic turf. And I watched the, the, the fragmented pieces of turf of, of plastic falling off and blowing in the wind to the nearest drain, to the nearest river course. We, we are just pumping plastic into the, uh, the world. It's, you know, it's not, it's not a good move. Yeah, it, it's, it's horrible it's, to fall onto and horrible to touch. And it's horrible the fact it's come out of some petrochemical, you know, source. Apparently, the, the River Thames has got the, some of the highest levels of microplastics of any river in, on the planet. So you look at the River Thames, and now it's a lot cleaner than it used to be, and there's a lot more wildlife, but we are literally plastifying the planet. And that comes down to those, those decisions, you know, the decisions we make about the things we buy and that we put out in the, in the, world, in the outside and how they degrade, and also how we make things. I think what, what David said about the decisions they're starting to make about how we manufacture things are really important. The decisions we make about how we make buildings are really important. On, on a project we did recently, we managed to get the carbon emissions associated with the manufacture of the building down by 50% by just changing the specification of certain things and construction techniques within that building. And that's the kind of the next level we need to go to. We need to understand every time we spend a pound to put up a wall or buy a plant or do anything has a direct impact on the planet. And we make a choice about how we do that. And there's undoubtedly, we, you know, there are impacts on the planet that are worth it because they're massively outweighed by the benefit they give to us. But so I'm not saying don't do anything and you can't do anything without impacting the planet. But it's like, you just need to ask that question. Like, what is the wider impact? Okay, fine. I've saved half an hour and my kids can run around on this lawn. But actually, I am putting millions of pizza, bits of microplastic out there over 20 years. This thing breaks down. And I think those are the kind of levels that we need to ask, slow down and ask those questions. And also... Okay, I understand that if your lawn gets trashed in the back garden, I do understand what, where that comes from, and I'm, I'm certainly not going to say it's wrong. But if it's about labour saving, is there anything more important, really, than that's so important you can't just look after your garden for a few hours a week and find some spiritual... So, and I'm, I'm a newly converted gardener, right? I, I haven't been a big gardener. The last couple of years I got really into it, and it is transforming my life, right? I am loving it. So I, I'm like a, I'm the worst kind of born again gardening person. <laughs> right, we're going to move on now to, I'm afraid, the last qu uh, question that we've had. Uh, lots come in and many apologies to uh, those of you whose questions we've not been able to uh, answer, but we're actually running out of time. Uh, I know uh, Clinton Baptiste directed this to Charlie. Um, I'm going to uh, put this, uh, these uh, two questions really, or it's a two part question. Uh, out to all of uh, you to conclude. So, uh, the two-part question, part A, do you think climate change is reversible? And if yes, how do we do it? And part B, how do we change the hearts and minds of those who don't believe that it's happening? Right, uh, who wants to start? That's a big... <laughs> I, <guess. laughs> I, th I thought it was originally for you, Charlie. I thought I wouldn't nail that one on you just in case it's... Uh, it's quite a big question. Yeah, well, I do, I do have an answer on that, actually. I, I'm going to say one thing. Um, the mini, you know, they used to have uh, 
ice fairs, frost fairs in London, ice fairs in London, where the Thames used to freeze over and they used to ice skate around on the Thames. And they had a mini sort of ice age between 1600 and 1700 or something. And they're increasingly thinking that that happened because the Amazon was very heavily uh, cultivated by the Aztecs. And when they died away because of European uh, diseases, the forest basically regrew. And it sucks so much CO2 out of the atmosphere that it dropped the climate's temperature by quite a significant enough that we had this mini ice age. If we started growing plants and trees everywhere across the planet, we could start to take a big lot of CO2 out of the atmosphere and start to unwind some of that, uh, it, that, some of that impact. And secondly, the, the way that technolo technology is advancing is hugely exciting that I think we can really drop the CO2 emissions that we've got over the next sort of 20 years. It's just, it needs to be front and center, not a nice bolt on. Or we might just be rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. <laughs> and we maybe should just be partying like it's 1999. <laughs> <laughs> what are you going to do then, John? You know, California. Uh, no, I, I really want to buy into Charlie's, uh, you know, optimism. Uh, I, I do, but Charlie's essentially dead on, and uh, we got to get to work, and we got to get to work fast. And uh, I, I just say a prayer. That's all, and just hope that we can, we can get it. We can get our act together, you know. That we can. Anyway. David, are you any more optimistic? Yes, I am. I am. I mean, it, it's a it's a very daunting prospect. The 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 youth, my daughters in particular, are beside themselves with frustration at the previous generations' mismanagement. But but everyone's done that, and they will also make mistakes. But their fervor and their commitment and their passion for just putting this right is having an influence on us. So I'm thinking that if you have an inkling that this is something that needs to be corrected and that is correctable in any way, I mean, it's, as, it's cycling to work. It's not buying a, a gas guzzling car. It's buying something a little more sensible and using it sensibly. All those little decisions, uh, each and every, if each and every decision has that, as Charlie said, in the forefront, not in the back, and that, that alone will start the process. Um, and very quickly, Singapore, 10, 15 years ago, passed a law that if you, if you built on an acre of ground, you had to put one and a half acres of garden into the building. So there, were, there then became competitions which actually added to the value of the property if a tower block went up on an acre and it, and it had three and a half acres of garden perched all over it in balconies, it actually became a selling point for the building. That's a really simple um, edict that could come down from planning that would just remind us and encourage us that there is a bigger picture. So I think uh, with those uh, concluding remarks, we uh, can discover that there is a lot of positivity despite uh, the negativity that surrounds us at the moment in the world of building and architecture. You know, there, there are uh, ideas that Charlie's uh, expressed that give us hope. Um, and John uh, Greenlee, of course, with his passion, well, really, if, um, if it was left to John, the whole world would be planted up, particularly with grasses. But he do it does mean that with with uh, his, uh, his ideas and his thoughts, he's creating an environment, a sustainable environment, that's not just suitable for the uh, flora and fauna, but also a much better uh, place for people to live in. So there's a lot of optimism, there's a lot of reason to think that this change in um, environmentally, uh, in gardening, so it becomes more environmentally friendly uh, and leans towards nature is something that's very positive. And of course, uh, David will also keep producing these uh, wonderful works to place in the gardens, to focus our mind, to elevate us ab uh, above the clouds of COVID uh, into uh, the light and the water and those wonderful descriptions that he gave us uh, of the natural world that uh, he uses, uh, to that he loves to reflect in his pieces of work. And I think really at the end of the day, if we do want to sort the world out, we'd perhaps better hand uh, everything over to David, but particularly to his daughters. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. I'm now going to hand over to...
to um, David to conclude. Great, thank you for that. Um, thank you, Matthew. Um, I guess uh, the conclusion really is that there is a common ground uh, between everyone speaking today. Uh, there is hope for the future. There's an awareness that there is a, there is a massive issue. Um, and let's continue to be inspired by the opportunities that nature constantly reminds us of and affords us. Um, so next time we'll be coming back with um, Marcus Friars, the editor-in-chief of DZEN, um, uh, for a talk on landscapes and uh, design, that's in September, and art in October. Um, so in the meantime, thank you all for joining us. Very um, edifying and fun, and uh, catch you all another time. So long. So long.